All right, engineers, in this video, we're gonna talk about the cranial nerve one or the olfactory nerve. Now, this is an important nerve because smell has a lot of important concepts. You know, not only is it important for just basically being able to smell things, but it's also really important for basically with the aspect of taste. And we'll talk about that when we get to taste. Because taste is really important because taste is actually 80% smell. All right, we'll talk about that when we get to the actual gustation pathway. But now what I wanna do is I wanna go over all the olfactory pathways. So what we're gonna do is, we're gonna talk about where you can actually find these olfactory receptors. We're gonna talk about the olfactory nerves and where they actually run through within the skull. We'll talk about the transduction process of how the odorants can actually produce different types of chemical and then electrical changes. And then we'll also follow the nerve impulse starting with those actual olfactory receptors to different parts of the cerebral cortex. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. And then we'll talk about clinical correlations. All right, so first things first. We have here a basically a sagittal section, a sagittal section of the actual nose. So we're looking at the nose from a sagittal view. So for example, this is the dude's honker, this is the hard palate, this is the teeth, this is the soft palate, and that's the uvula, right? Now back here, if you can see here, this is the cribiform plate of the ethmoid bone. So let's actually kind of denote some of these structures here. And then again, this guy hasn't been trimming his uh, hedges for a, a bit. He's got some nasal hairs there, right? So again, if this right here, this would be the external nares. This is obviously the nasal cavity. Again, this is the hard palate. This would be your teeth. And if you, you know, we'll go over teeth anatomy on uh, one of the models. We have the central incisors, the canines, the lateral incisors, the premolars, and the actual molars. And then right here, you're gonna have the soft palate. And we'll have here the uvula, right? And then up here, what did we say this was? We said this was actually going to be the cribiform plate of the ethmoid bone. All right, so first off, with cranial nerve one, one thing we wanna understand is, is where, again, would you actually find cranial nerve one, all right? Well, first, before we do that, we have to look inside here. So right here at the actual roof of the nasal cavity, there is the specialized olfactory neurons. Now, let's actually show something real quick. You know, one of the things that is important about the actual nasal cavity is there's a lot of mucus there's a lot of mucus in this area. And the purpose of the mucus is important because not only is it good for basically helping to humidify the incoming air, warm the incoming air, moisten the incoming air, but also certain particles. So let's say for whatever reason, you know, I smell some type of odor, all right? Let's say that I farted, all right? I ripped one, I cut the cheese, right? And that odor that's coming from the fart, right? is actually gonna move through what? The external nares. Then it's gonna move into the nasal cavity. Then from the nasal cavity, what happens? This gas from the fart, right? So it's just usually like methane, and depending on some people, there might even be some other funky smells in there too, right? But this methane, CH4, is actually gonna move. It's gonna be a, a, a volatile gas, right? So it's gonna be able to be a gas. That odor is gonna move through the nasal cavity, but here's the important part. You see this mucus layer? Not only is, like I said, important for basically humidifying the incoming air, warming the air, moistening the air, but it can also trap odor particles. So this odor particle, let's actually denote it with like this little dot here. This is our methane gas from that fart that I let out, right? What's gonna happen is it's gonna dissolve into this actual mucus layer. Why is that important? Because right here, you're actually going to have these special bipolar neurons here. You have these special bipolar neurons. You see these bipolar neurons, they have one uh, dendrite extension and then they have one axon extension. So they have a dendrite extension and a axon extension. These right here <clears throat> are bipolar neurons and they're actually going to be specifically the olfactory nerves, all right? So this is the actual olfactory receptor here with the terminals. This is the olfactory cell body, and this is the olfactory axons that'll come up to form the olfactory nerve, and we'll talk about that in a second, okay? So now, what I'm gonna do is, I'm just gonna bring a couple of these together. Let me just draw like uh, two more. 
and explain what's going to happen here. So these olfactory neurons actually have these axons that we said, right? And these axons are important because most of the axons are going to come together, a whole bunch of them. A good amount of these guys are going to come together, about 20 of them. Obviously, I'm only doing a couple here. I'm only doing five. But I want you guys to understand that this nerve that's running through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone, you see this nerve right here that we have running through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone into this thing cart here? What is this big sucker right here? This is called the olfactory bulb. This is right underneath the actual frontal lobe of the cerebral cortex. So right here, if I were to actually kind of draw here, this would actually be, if I were to have this in brown here, what would this part be? This would actually be a part of the frontal lobe. So this would actually be a part of the frontal lobe of the cerebral cortex. So just giving you kind of some like a neuroanatomy and basically just what, what's around this area. Okay, so again, the olfactory neurons are actually located within the upper, the roof of the nasal cavity, all right? And they're gonna be surrounded by some epithelial cells and we'll talk about those in just a second. But I want you to understand that these little dendritic extensions, the parts that are actually gonna be the terminals that are picking up these different types of odorants, they're actually gonna be exposed within this actual mucus layer. They're basically like little cilia. You see those little extensions there? These little extensions are basically cilia, but they're immotile cilia. We have to remember that. This is immotile. They're basically just little cytoplasmic extensions that help to be able to have increased surface area to exposure to these odorants. Now, like I said, a whole bunch of these axons come together, and when they come together, they form the olfactory, an olfactory nerve. So there can be many olfactory nerves. I just drew one here. For example, I could have a whole bunch of other ones over here too if I needed to. And these guys could come together here. And these guys could come together as a olfactory nerve. I'm not gonna draw all of them. I just want you guys to get the point, okay? So the olfactory nerves are actually moving together as a bundle of axons, about 20 of them from these different olfactory neurons. Now, what's next to them? There's a lot of different types of epithelial cells. So there's actually a lot of epithelial cells near here. So there's actually these different epithelial cells. And these epithelial cells are important because they're like a they're penny, you know the size of a penny? About the thinness of a penny is about how thin these cells are. That's how thin they are. But there's a lot of these epithelial cells, and these epithelial cells are important because not only are they good for supporting these actual olfactory cells, but they're also good at being able to produce a little bit of uh, mucus, right? And also helping with movement of the air, all right? So you're actually gonna have some cells here, and they will have some ciliary extensions here, and these are motile ciliary extensions. There's also gonna be other different types of things around this area. You know there's a lot of glands too? There's actually going to be glands in this area, a lot of nasal glands. There's a lot of different types of nasal glands in this area that are also nearby to these actual what? These olfactory neurons. So a lot of these actual olfactory neurons are going to be next to glands. And these glands are important because they produce different types of this mucus here, this mucus lining. Okay, so what have we got so far about the structure? We know that there's going to be epithelial cells, supportive epithelial cells. Right, and they're gonna have a cilia. You're also gonna know that there's gonna be these glandular structures, these nasal glandular structures that are also gonna be present within this area. I also call them Bowman's glands. They also call them Bowman's glands. And you're gonna have these olfactory neurons, the cell bodies and the dendritic extensions and their axons can come together, about 20 of them will bundle them together to form an olfactory nerve that'll run up through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone and into the olfactory bulb, okay? Now, what I want to do is, I want to see exactly how this odorant, because we know how the odorant's moving, right? So we've done that. We know how the odorant's moving. We know where the odorant's going to. We know it's dissolving into this actual mucus lining here, and it's activating these ciliary and motile extensions that are activating this, uh, what, this bipolar neuron, this olfactory neuron that's running nearby to Bowman's glands, which are just mucus glands, and by epithelial supportive cells. <clears throat> and the axons are coming together to form the olfactory nerve, about 20 of them to run through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone into the olfactory bulb, which is just inferior to the frontal lobe of the cerebral cortex. Oh, and, and again, I just wanna make sure that you guys aren't confused on this. This right here, this blue part here, is the olfactory, oh, this should not have an E in here. There should be no E in there, sorry. 
This blue part here is actually called the olfactory bulb. All right. This part here is the frontal lobe of the cerebral cortex. All right. So now let's go ahead and see how this odorant material, how this odor is actually activating what? This ciliary and motile extensions, these dendritic extensions of the olfactory neuron. So let's see that here. Okay, now here's what's really, really important. Let's say that I have three olfactory neurons here. This is, this is a really important concept, so I want to make sure I make this part clear here. Okay, so let's say this is olfactory neuron. Let's actually do these in different colors so they're not confused. Okay, so let's actually, no, we'll do it in the same color, but we'll change one part of it. Okay, and we'll have this part here and this part here. So let's say this is olfactory neuron one, olfactory neuron two, olfactory neuron three. On these actual ciliary extensions, they express a specific type of receptor protein. But here's the, here's the really, really important thing. This receptor protein on this one is all of them are going to be that green receptor protein. That green receptor protein is going to be the same green receptor protein for all of the other ciliary extensions on this olfactory nerve, right? Then if I have over here, let's say that this is another odorant receptor, but that odorant receptor is going to be specific to this olfactory neuron, the second olfactory neuron. Then this last one over here, let's make this like a maroonish color. This is going to be having olfactory receptors. This little protein receptor is responding to different types of odors that is specific to this olfactory neuron. What am I trying to tell you? Olfactory neurons on their little ciliary extensions, they express one type of specific receptor protein. All right, let's have four different odors here, just to give you an example. Let's say here I have odor one. All right, here's odor one. Then let's say I have odor two. And let's say I have another one, odor three. And then one more for the sake of it, and this is going to be odor four. And this could be anything, right? Here's what I want you guys to get. Each one of these is expressing a specific type of olfactory receptor, right? Here's what's cool. That olfactory receptor could respond to multiple odorants. What does that mean? You see this one right here? One, two, three, and four could possibly bind onto that receptor right there, all right? Also, maybe three only binds onto four, and maybe it only binds onto three, all right? Or maybe one and two only bind onto this olfactory neuron. So the whole point is, is that these olfactory neurons express a specific type of receptor protein, but that receptor protein can respond to multiple odorants. Here's another cool thing. This is what's awesome. Is, remember I told you this odorant could bind onto this one. What if this odorant also binds onto this one? That's another really cool thing. One odorant can bind onto many different types of olfactory receptor proteins. Okay, so let's make this really clear. Olfactory neurons express one type of receptor protein, but many odorants can bind onto that one receptor protein. Also, one odorant can bind onto many receptor proteins, okay? So that's one of the beautiful things about this. But now, now that we got that out of the way, let's talk about how this odorant is triggering some type of chemical and then electrical activity to occur. So look here on the membrane. Let's say I put here that specific receptor protein. And it's actually interesting because this protein is a part of the G protein coupled receptors. So it's a part of the G protein coupled receptors. So here was my fart odor, right? So here was the methane gas. So let's say here's the methane gas. And this could have been any chemical, I just picked this one. This methane will bind onto this G protein coupled receptor. When it binds onto this G protein coupled receptor, it activates a specific type of G protein. And this G protein is actually, they actually call it G olfactory protein. They call, it, they call it G olfactory protein. This G olfactory protein is normally bound to a GDP. But then what happens is it gets rid of the GDP and binds on a GTP. And then it becomes super active. 
when it becomes super active, it moves forward and activates a special enzyme, which is located on the cell membrane here. Let's draw this enzyme in green. This enzyme, which is actually located on the membrane here, look at this guy. He is ready. Okay, this enzyme is actually called adenylate cyclase. We're going to denote this A C, adenylate cyclase. What happens is this G olfactory protein comes over here and binds onto a specific site on this adenylate cyclase. When it binds onto a specific site in the adenylate cyclase, it activates the adenylate cyclase. Now the adenylate cyclase is activated. When it's activated, it converts ATP into what's called cyclic AMP. Now, here's what's really cool. There's these channels, special channels. Let's do this with red. Where's my red marker? All right. Let's say here's this channel right here, special channel. Let's make it gargantuous because there's going to be a lot of ions coming out of this one. Okay. What happens is cyclic AMP has a special type of receptor or binding site on this channel. And what happens is cyclic AMP comes over here and it binds onto this little receptor site. When it binds onto the receptor site, it opens this channel up. Normally this channel is closed. Whenever cyclic AMP is rising, the levels of cyclic AMP are rising, what happens? It binds onto this channel and the channel opens. When this channel opens, two cations flow in. One of the main ones is going to be sodium. Another one that's going to flow in is calcium. And I need to explain this one for just a second, but I will here in just a second. We're going to do something else first. And then another ion is leaving. And I need to mention this one. I'm going to put this in this bluish color. And we're going to move up to the top for just a second. The chloride ions are coming out. OK, why am I telling you that the chloride ions are coming out? Because chloride is one of the big, big components in this mucus layer. So one of the really important components of this mucus layer is going to be chloride, OK? Just so that we have that understanding there. OK, now let's come back down here. Now, sodium ions are coming in, calcium ions are coming in, chloride ions are going out. What's going to happen? Let's say I put here a graph. All right. Here on the x-axis is going to be time, specifically in milliseconds. Here on the y-axis is going to be millivolts. Let's say that this olfactory neuron's resting membrane potential is at negative 70 millivolts. All right. So it's at negative 70 millivolts, and that's where its resting membrane potential is. Let's say that it has a certain threshold. And let's say that that threshold potential is only negative 55 millivolts. Let's say that's its threshold. OK, let's suppose. If cyclic AMP is going to act on these channels, positive ions are going to flow in, and negative ions are going to leave. If negative ions are leaving, this cell is becoming increasingly more positive. If this cell, let's do this in red, so it's nice and bright. If this cell is approaching threshold, once it actually reaches this threshold point, right, the cyclic AMP activates this right here, this guy will reach threshold very quickly. And when it reaches threshold very quickly, it'll activate and move very, very quickly to generate an action potential. All right, so it'll reach threshold. And then right after that, it'll generate a very powerful action potential. So this is going to produce a action potential down the axon. All right, so it'll reach this point here of threshold, open up some more channels, and have more sodium, more calcium, more chloride ions leave, and then this will produce a rising phase of the action potential. Now, let me mention this calcium for a second. This calcium is important. Calcium is important for basically adaptation. It's important for adaptation. So what happens is calcium is going to come in and activate these olfactory neurons, right? But have you guys ever um, experienced being around a smell for a long period of time? Let's say that you're, uh, you come home, your grandmother's cooking some really good food. When you come home and your grandmother's cooking really, really good food, you walk in the door and it hits you really quickly, right? And you're like, mmm, that smells good, right? But over time, what starts happening? The smell or the, the potency of the smell or the power of the smell or how much you become uh, able to recognize that smell decreases over time. 
that is how calcium is affecting this. Calcium is playing a role within the adaptation. So it's playing a role within these actual changes in the membrane potentials so that these action potentials are going to be only allowing for this adaptive movement to the actual cerebral cortex. So the once you're exposed to your grandma's cooking for a bit, eventually you start becoming desensitized to it. All right? So calcium is important for that adaptation response. Okay. Now, if you think about it like this, here was down here. We stimulated these ciliary extensions, right? These non-motile ciliary extensions or these dendritic extensions here. And what happens? If you stimulated this by the sodium flowing in, the calcium flowing in, the chloride flowing out, what's going to happen? It's going to generate that action potential. When it generates the action potential, what's going to do? It's going to send these information down to the what? Cell body. And when the cell body generates these action potentials also, then what's going to happen? It's going to send these action potentials down the axons. All right? So it's going to send it down the axons. Now, when it sends it down these axons, where are these axons going to go? We'll come up here for a second. Where would they go? Okay, well, they activated the odorants here. It moves up here. And now they're going to be moving up through this olfactory nerve. And again, it'll be activating over here, moving upwards, sending this information up through the olfactory nerve, up to the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. All right, sweet deal. So what have we gotten to so far? We know the nasal cavity structure. We know what cells are there. We know about the olfactory neurons. We went over a little bit of their actual general anatomy, microscopic anatomy. We went over zooming in on one of these extensions right here. Because so all we were really doing is, is we were kind of just zooming in on this area right here. And we were kind of looking at that in a larger view. Right? And we were seeing how these odorants were stimulating these actual uh, olfactory receptors. And we talked about the relationship with olfactory receptors and odorants, and odorants with olfactory receptors. We showed the transduction pathway, and then we showed the action potential moving down the axons. Okay. Now that we've done that and we talked about adaptation, let's talk about how these action potentials are going to the cerebral cortex. So here we go. Let's have our mucus layer right here. So what was this layer here? This was our mucus layer. And what was one of the ions contributing to the mucus layer? Chloride. Now, what will we have right here? We would have the bipolar neurons. And these bipolar neurons are going to be specifically what? The olfactory neurons. And the olfactory neurons have these extensions that move into the mucus lining. And then we said whenever they're activated, what happens? They send. That's actually what we're only going to do here, three here. And we'll do these three over here. OK? And these guys are going to move upwards, up through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. So they move up through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone, and these move up through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. Now, as these axons of the olfactory nerves are moving up through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone, they enter into what's called the olfactory bulb. Now, in the olfactory bulb, they give off their axon terminals. They give off a bunch of different axon terminals. Now. Here's what's really cool. There's another cell in this area. Look at this guy. He's a really cool one, too. And he's going to give off extensions here. And these extensions, these extensions here, are going to interact with these axon terminals. And then this is going to be its dendritic extensions, and then it's going to have an axon here. And let's just say, for example, I put one more branch here coming up through this middle part here. Let's just say for this part here, I have this guy coming up here too. OK? And then again, what would it give off? It would give off its axon terminal extensions, where it would release certain types of chemicals. And then again, what would this be having? It would have its dendritic extensions right here coming up and moving into this cell body and coming out as that axon. Same thing here. What would we have? Cell body, dendritic extensions, and then coming out as the axon. OK, this area right here that I'm going to kind of circle around here, this is a specialized structure which is located within the olfactory bulb. This structure here is called the glomerulus. This is, and this is not related to the glomerulus in the kidney. So remember, this is the glomerulus in the olfactory bulb. This is called the glomerulus. Now, the glomerulus is consisting of what? It's consisting of the axon terminals of the olfactory nerves, and it's consisting of the dendritic extensions of these red cells. What are these red cells called? These red cells are called mitral cells. So these are called mitral cells. Now, mitral cells are spe uh, very special. 
And I want to talk about this for a second. Let's say that I have again odor one, odor two, and odor three. Let's say odor one activates specific types of receptors, right? And those specific types of receptors, what will happen? They'll send their action potentials up through these olfactory neurons, right? Up through the olfactory nerve, and they'll go to a specific glomerulus. So for a glomerulus that has a specific odor that it responds to. But like anything, we know that an odor can activate multiple different types of receptor types. So that means that you could activate a many subsets of glomeruli. When these glomeruli are going to be having these extensions in here, what happens is this olfactory neuron release certain chemicals, certain types of neurotransmitters that'll act on these dendritic extensions here of the mitral cells. So it'll release certain types of neurotransmitters and these neurotransmitters will be excitatory neurotransmitters that will activate this actual mitral cell. When the mitral cell is activated, it will send action potentials down their axons. Here's what's really cool. You see this, all these fibers here? This fiber here that's moving in this area here is called the olfactory tract. So this whole structure right here is called the olfactory tract. There's one other cell that I want to mention that's in this vicinity also. There's another cell which is having extensions connecting to this dendritic extension and it also has extensions that can actually release onto these mitral cells. So it has an extension here on the dendrites and it also is going to have extensions here for this mitral cell. These cells are called granule cells. So they're like amacrine granule cells. So what are these green cells here called? They're called granule cells or amacrine-like granule cells. What's really special about these is that they're basically going to be excited. They can be excited by these mitral cells. So what can happen is, let's say that the action potentials are moving upwards, right? The action potentials are moving upwards and when they move upwards, what can happen is they can actually stimulate these granule cells. So you can stimulate these granule cells. But they're specifically activated by the mitral cells, by these dendritic extensions of the mitral cells. If they're activated, what can happen is they can release certain chemicals onto the mitral cells. What is that chemical? The main chemical that they secrete is called gamma amino butric acid, GABA. So they're GABAergic neurons. Now one of the things that you guys should remember for most of neuro is that GABA is primarily an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So what does that mean? It would inhibit the mitral cell. Huh, that's weird. So what this one do then too? It would also inhibit this mitral cell. It would inhibit this mitral cell. Oops, not this guy. Inhibit this guy. And inhibit this guy. Now, here's why this is happening. These granule cells are basically going to only be allowing the most excitatory impulses to go to the actual central nervous system. So the function of the granule cells, or the amacrine-like granule cells, is they're affected by these mitral cells. So they can be stimulated by the mitral cells, and they can release gabergic uh, materials onto these mitral cells to inhibit them. The purpose of that is to make sure that only the most excitatory impulses that are coming from the olfactory neurons reach the cerebral cortex. Only the most excitatory. All right, cool. So now that we understand that, that's great. So now, another thing here is if you want to, there is another structure here in the back here. Um, it's right near this structure here. We can actually draw this one in brown. It's actually called the olfactory tubercle. So it's actually called the olfactory tubercle. So they call this the olfactory tubercle. And what the olfactory tubercle can do is it actually has axons that can come out here, efferent axons that can release certain types of chemicals onto this granule cells that can stimulate them. And basically, again, control the most excitatory impulses going to the central nervous system. All right, cool. There is another cell in here too, so it doesn't just have to be mitral cells. There is one other one. It's not as important, but I'm going to mention it just for the sake of it. There is other cells in here called tufted cells. Tufted cells. The only difference is with the tufted cells is that for this actual mitral cell, its extensions are only going to one glomeruli. So it's actually only going to one glomeruli. Where now if I were to compare here, let's say I have a tufted cell. A tufted cell has its extensions going to many, many different types of 
lamellulae. So that's the only difference here is that if I were to take, for example, this tufted cell here, this green cell, this would have extensions going to many, many different lamellulae, right? Whereas the actual mitral cell only has it coming to one glomeruli. That's a little bit of a kind of important thing about the tufted cells. But they're, again, not super, super important. All right. Now, once this starts moving, all right, this olfactory tract, it will branch into two different structures. So to come here, this is actually, this green structure here is called the anterior perforating substance. So it's actually called the anterior perforated substance. And what will happen is this olfactory tract will split into two striae. One striae will go this way, and one striae will go this way. Okay. This striae right here is actually going to be really, really important one. Okay, this one here is called the lateral olfactory striae. So this one right here is called the lateral olfactory striae. And what the lateral olfactory striae does is it brings these fibers into a specific part of the actual central nervous system. So you know you have your frontal lobes, you have your parietal lobes, you have your temporal lobe. In the really deep part of the temporal lobe, in the medial aspect, you have a structure called the uncus. Right? And what happens is this actual lateral olfactory striae supplies a lot of different structures around the uncus. So it can supply the uncus. It can also supply what's called the piriform cortex. Okay, so the piriform cortex of the temporal lobe. Now the piriform cortex of the temporal lobe is the primary olfactory cortex. And there's a lot of different structures that are located within this vicinity. It also can give off fibers not just to the piriform cortex, but it can give it off to what's called the hippocampal gyrus. It can give it off to what's called the amygdaloid complex. And it could even give it off to one more branch here called the into, entorhinal complex. Okay? Many different structures here, but the whole purpose of this primary olfactory cortex is to become consciously aware or perceive the actual olfaction. Now another thing is, is these uh, other fibers here is called the medial olfactory striae. So these fibers up here are called the medial olfactory striae. And the medial olfactory striae are actually going to give branches to another part here. It's actually going to move around what's called the paraolfactory area. And it's going to go to a specific gyrus here called the subcolossal gyrus. So it's going to go to what's called the subcolossal gyrus. They say it also can give branches to another area, um, which is the orbitofrontal cortex. So they also say it can give uh, some fibers to what's called the orbito frontal cortex, okay, which is on the frontal lobe. And that's kind of the secondary olfactory area. They believe that it's more in line with the determining the reward of olfaction, the value of the olfaction, all right? So that's that aspect. Now, some one thing that's also important is that some of these fibers can cross to the other side. So smell can be bilateral. So in other words, if you clog this part here, you can actually pick up some smell from the on the other side too. So they believe that small amounts of fibers can actually be contralateral. They cross to the other side of the actual cerebral hemisphere. Whereas most of the fibers are ipsilateral, going to the same side. But the smell is bilateral. Okay? So that takes care of that part. Now, we've talked a lot here about, again, the structures of the olfactory nerves, where it's running through. We talked about the transduction pathway. We talked about the olfactory pathway. We talked about where it's going to in the cerebral cortex. Now I want to say what can happen if it's not functioning correctly. What is it called when it, your actual, you can't smell or the lack or the inability of smell? It's called anosmia. And anosmia is terrible. I mean, imagine not being able to smell. Well, most people actually probably know one of the most common causes of anosmia. The most common cause of anosmia is usually going to be some type of nasal infection. 
So some type of nasal infection where a lot of mucus builds up or maybe even a paranasal infection. All right, so some type of paranasal infection, like a sinus infection basically. Okay, so paranasal sinus infections. Any type of situation like that, a lot of mucus builds up. And if the mucus builds up, imagine this, this layer thicker. So imagine this actual mucus layer even thicker. What's going to happen? The odor molecules have to travel a farther distance. They have to get dissolved a farther amount. If they need to be dissolved more, how much of these actual odor molecules will actually reach the olfactory receptors? Not many. And so you're going to have the lack of smell. You know what else is important? Remember I told you that smell is directly related to taste. If you guys have ever been really, really sick, have been really, really clogged up, have a nasal infection, sinus infection, you'll probably also notice that taste of food was also not very great. It was kind of bland, right? And that's because a lot of these information from the olfactory neurons are going to be intertwined with the cerebral cortex in certain taste centers, okay? Another cause of anosmia besides these, this is obviously the most common, but one of the second kind of most common ones is some type of olfactory groove meningiomas. And the reason why is, you know, whenever this actual olfactory nerves are running up into the olfactory bulb, right here's the bone. There's a periosteal layer of the dura mater, and then right underneath it is, uh, right, uh, right here would be the meningeal layer of the dura mater. So it actually runs through what? It would run through the dura mater and through the subarachnoid space into the olfactory bulb. Okay? So some type of tumor that's developing here could also affect the olfactory nerves. Another thing, what if I punch you so hard in the nose that I, I break the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone and I lacerate some of these nerves? That also could be another common cause. So some type of trauma, I punch you so hard in the face and I break the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. Another thing is since it's connected to the subarachnoid space, some fluid can actually leak out. You know that's a terrible condition when fluid can actually leak out from the, the, the actual cerebrospinal fluid leaks out of the nose. They call that rhinorrhea. They actually call that rhinorrhea. Anyway, it could be due to a really, really bad fracture in that area or some other causes. But again, I want you guys to understand that what can happen if this smell is actually affected. One other thing is that if there is anosmia, that's usually the sign of early onset of neurodegenerative diseases. So usually it's one of the clinical signs of someone who's developing maybe Lewy body dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, is they start losing their ability to smell. So it's an unfortunate thing. All right, engineers, in this video we talked about the olfactory nerve. We went over it in great detail. I hope it all made sense. I hope you guys really did enjoy it. If you guys did, please hit the like button, comment down in the comment section, and as always, please subscribe. All right, engineers, until next time.